on 30 is the plan. And before I pass the mic back to Chris, I wanted to mention that tomorrow night, um, Rob and I are hosting a social and a fun event for our book launch. And that's the reason Chris is actually in town is he's the technical editor for the series, uh, the Sustainable Building Essentials series, one book of which is uh, Sustainable Home Design, which is the book you've been referencing, which I should have brought a copy. You don't have a copy? Yeah. When you fly, we're like the worst books, books in the yeah, world. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We're the worst book sellers ever. Yeah. We're like, the book, the yeah. book. Um, so that the sustainable home design book is the is when they're talking about the book that a lot of the material from this course has come out of, that's the book, part of the sustainable building essentials. And Rob and I just uh, on tomorrow we're launching the uh what's the name of our book? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Central Rainwater Harvesting. So uh, there's a few tickets left, not many, for the social, the really fun networking event we're going to host tomorrow night at the Cold Garden. I used to call it the Cold Garden Microbrewery. I've been corrected. It's the Cold Garden Beverage Company. I don't know what the difference is. Uh, if you want to come to that, Chris will be there. We'll be there. It'll be a really good opportunity to um, chat, meet more people doing this kind of stuff. So. I wanted to mention that, all right? Any questions? All right. Back to you, Chris. Great, thanks. Okay, so um, the next short section that I wanna do uh, before we really get into the weeds of like specific materials and systems and all that kind of stuff is just a, like a bit of mental exercise around like, how do you think about new things? Like how, like how do we process these things? How do we put them into some kind of context? Um, and I mean, there, there are many, many, many things that we accept as normal that don't make any sense at all. Like, you know, I mean, if I came to you right now and we've never had automobiles and I said, I've got this thing that I'm going to propose. It's that like cars, you know, you get in them, you can drive anywhere you want to go. And then you would say, yeah, but what's the downside? And I would have to say, oh, they're pretty expensive. They're going to kill a lot of people. Uh, they spew poison, like and on and on and on and on. And you're going to sit in traffic. We're going to like, you know, smash the planet to make roads. Oh yeah, this, the fuel's got to cut. Like there would be so many negatives that you would go, yeah, okay, thanks for the idea, but you know, next, uh, we're not interested. Um, so, like, but once something becomes normalized, you stop thinking about that thing as as an option. You just think of it as a reality, and you don't sort of ask the hard questions. But so, when somebody comes along with an alternative, well, you're going to grill them for those answers, you know. And um, like a good example in the building world is. You know, we do a lot of earthen plasters inside and people will be like, oh yeah, but doesn't that chip and dent really easily? And it's like, doesn't drywall chip and dent really easily? <laughs> like, you know, um, doesn't that turn to mush if it gets really wet? It's like, doesn't drywall turn to mush if it gets really Like, you know, sometimes, you, but you just don't ask those questions of the thing that you're used to, but you ask them of the thing you're not used to, which is a good thing to do. I'm not saying to be uncritical, but um, just to sort of think about you know, how you're being critical. And again, going back to those criteria, like if, if the downsides of the thing you're looking at contradict your goals, then that it's not worth doing. But if the thing that you're thinking about doesn't contradict your goals and in fact supports them, then the fact that it's different or new or unique or not something you've considered before shouldn't be uh, getting in your way necessarily. So, um, so all of the stuff that, that we're going to talk about in terms of buildings and building material, this is, this is from an overall societal point of view, this is lightweight stuff, right? That you could, you could switch our entire building industry to a completely carbon sequestering plant-based, high performance, low carbon, you know, affordable thing. And it's way easier than making a large hadron collider, you know? Um, like we're talking really basic technology. We're talking like minimal shifts in the way things are already done. Um, you know, we're really talking um, a lot of material substitutions and the materials that need to be substituted uh, aren't complex, aren't expensive. 
Um, and, you know, it wouldn't take much to get them there. You know, if I think about, you know, the earth and plaster thing, the reason you would choose drywall over earth and plaster is you can go to the store and buy drywall. You can't go to the store and buy earth and plaster. But in Japan, you can phone up the earth supply, earth plaster supply company and order one of like 50 different recipes and they bring it to your site and it comes down a chute and your plasters put it on the wall and that's not hard to do. Like we have those machines and we have that stuff and that's pretty low tech uh, stuff to do. So, you know, right now we're in an interesting spot where, you know, there are all these really interesting possibilities that aren't at scale yet or aren't at market. And most of the drawbacks to them aren't technical drawbacks, they are market drawbacks. They're harder to get, slightly more expensive, more labor intensive to apply, whatever it happens to be. But those, those things are overcomable in the same way that, that we overcame and we, we switched to drywall because you know, for a while, it was cheaper to have big machines crank out sheets of things than to have a laborer stand on your building and, and wet apply a plaster. Um, but, um, you know, the, the, what it would take to say, make an actual building product out of straw versus make a building product out of styrofoam, the straw is way simpler. Like it's a way less technical thing to do. It's just nobody's done it yet. So we're sort of at an, at an interesting, uh, an interesting spot. So, you know, some of this is, you know, the people who believe in this, if you believe in it, you, you have to sort of be willing to be a, a driver. Um, and if you're not a driver, that's okay. Like you can choose to, to you know, not do that. But, um, you know, all of these things need uh, that push of, of examples being put out there. Um, the one from building that I really like to point to a lot is, you know, same as if I propose the car, if I propose wood, to a building inspector, like wood frame construction, and there had been no wood frame construction, say like everything had been made out of stone. And then suddenly this guy shows up and he's like, yeah, I cut down a tree and I milled it into a stick. And if I put a bunch of these sticks together with like these little metal things that I knock in, uh, this is gonna be great, it's gonna be awesome. And my building inspector would say, oh yeah, it burns, it rots, it twists, it splits, Bugs eat it, like the list of, of drawbacks to wood, potential drawbacks to wood are as long as any other alternative. And it's like, but it also had these great qualities, like it's easy to shape, there's a lot of it. It's easy to attach, you know, like it's easy to cut. It's, you know, all of those things. And so like we take it, uh, these ideas and we make an industry about it. Like it's, there's no greater leap to using hemp or straw or ground up tires or, like any alternative that's out there um, usually doesn't have any more of what I would call micro flaws than the things that already exist. It's just, we've kind of like internalized all the micro flaws of the, the ones we're used to. And we get really spooked by the potential micro flaws and things that we're not used to. So, you know, I guess all of this to say like, you know, sometimes it takes just taking a step back and thinking about, you know, uh, is this, what, what is my reaction to this alternative and, and uh, does it make sense? You know, if you think about when people first started making cement, like Ontario is full of, of, of homemade cement kilns. <laughs> people took their own limestone and made a fire underneath it and cooked the stuff and smashed it up and mixed it with water and gravel and made barn foundations out of it. And some worked really well and some are crumbling like crazy now. And, but if you had seen that process at that time, you would go, I don't know about that. Like that's not really, that's a lot of work and it's not very efficient. And yet like the, the, the product was worth pursuing. And now we've got this amazing industry that, you know, you can place a phone call and four hours later, a truck shows up and the exact right mix comes out the chute and you put it in your forms and it works. <coughs> you know, what I'm saying is there's no reason that couldn't be an earthen mix. There's no reason that couldn't be, you know, any number of things, uh, to make that technological leap. Um, and so the example that I would most like to point to in terms of like this whole notion of people saying, well, does that work? Like, does it really work? Is, is uh, toilets, composting toilets and flush toilets. Um, and just a quick show of hands, who has had a toilet back up on them and, and put the yuck on the floor in front of them? So it's like a hundred percent failure rate, right? <laughs> we, we have this technology that deals with our poop and it fails, guaranteed it's going to fail at some point and leave you a really nasty mess. 
does anybody ever say to you, flush toilets don't work? Like, I'm never going to have a flush toilet. It doesn't work. No, you never hear that. Like, it works enough of the time, well enough for a reasonable enough cost with a reasonable amount of efficiency that we live with the odd blip and everything comes out. So that's, you know, those are things that I would call a micro flaw. Like, you know, in general, the toilet works fine. You know, something happens, it gets clogged up, it makes a mess, you put up with that micro flaw. How many people have heard that composting toilets are awful, that they smell, that they don't work, that, you know, I, mean, I hear that all the time. And it's like, but it's the same thing. Like it works 99% of the time. And if the conditions are right, it works all the time. And those failures are like attributable to a specific thing that went wrong that can be fixed and it will work again. But because this is newer and different, like we were tended to, oh yeah, that doesn't work. You know, my uncle said it didn't work, so it doesn't work. So I'm not going to think about it. Um, and so, you know, on the micro level, the flaws are actually pretty similar. You know, if too much goes down the down the flush toilet and it gets stuck and it backs up, that's a problem. If the composter air gets too wet, too much urine, not enough dry matter, it starts to smell. Same level of microflow. Both things can be remedied fairly uh, easily. I think what we're all doing here is trying to see beyond those microflow. So we can say, okay, yeah, you know, flush toilet, I'm thinking about that, it, it might do this, it's, you know, it's got these things, and composting toilet's got these things. And then you stand back and you go, huh, a composting toilet makes compost. Like, <laughs> that's the, you know, the end result, the wider picture scheme is you end up with a, a, a soil amendment. Um, and the last I checked, that's a pretty good thing. The flush toilet leads to this, like, you know, you have anything from like individual sized septic tanks to huge municipal uh, wastewater systems that are hugely problematic. I mean, the reason we can't go swimming in there safely is because of this, um, you know, the, the vast amount of, uh, uh, you know, surface water uh, in our, in our part of the world is contaminated from us shitting in it. And like, so you can talk about the micro flaws of flush toilets or, or composting toilets, but when you compare them on this level, to me, like there's no comparison. And you, 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 know, you, you say yes to the micro flaws of the system that gives you the, on the wider scale, the, the, the better result. But is there where the government gets involved, where the government allows that and the government says, don't worry about it, we'll look after it. Well, you can look after it yourself in this situation. <laughs> And if the government does the opposite and says, like in Scandinavia, everybody will have a composting toilet. It's a law. Do it. And then everybody's forced yeah. to use it. So where are we going? Yeah, well, I think that's the question. I think it takes people sort of doing these things by choice to sort of lead that. I don't think the government is going to lead by example. I think leaders need to lead by example and, and sometimes regulation follows them. And just to sort of give you a little bit of a, a sense of the scale of, of that problem. So here's the sewage report card. This is from 1999, so it's a bit old. I haven't seen them do a new one, but. me, you know, that's what motivates me to look at uh, an alternative when I see on the larger scale those kind of impacts. And then inevitably, you get this yeah, but response, like, okay, yeah, here's, here's a good idea. I'm going to put this out in front of you. And, and most people will give you this, oh, it'll give you all the reasons it won't work. And with composting toilets, one of the reasons is, well, nobody will want to deal with their composting toilet. To which I say, people do this. <laughs> like we put enough social pressure on people 
to say, your dog's crap on my lawn is not okay. I ask you to pick it up. And people do. Like people put their hand in a plastic bag and like wrap that. <laughs> and a composted toilet does not ask you to get that close to <laughs> anything. Um, and we did that by social pressure. We did that by saying, it's not okay for you to leave this mess on my lawn. We could just as easily say, it's not okay for you to sit in my drinking water. Like that seems like an appropriate sort of social pressure uh, to be able to put out there. And I do think that, that you know, um, the response will be there. But they're willing to buy toxic fertilizer and toxic herbicide mm -hmm. to keep their lawn green and throw away the good stuff <laughs> yeah. because it has to go down the pipe. Yeah. And they're not fertilizing their garden with that. Absolutely, yeah. And you know, again, this is without looking at how how this could be put into larger practice. So, you know, yes, dealing with your own personal composting toilet system does mean like you're gonna lift a bucket or you're gonna take out a tray or you're gonna in some way, you know, do this. But you know. We're going to, at the end of the day today, put out a, a bin of food waste that somebody's going to come along in a truck and take that food waste and take it away. Why not a sealed toilet bucket, you know, that gets put out and somebody comes to the curb and takes that away to a composting facility and it, it all happens. And that then you're not dealing with it personally, um, but, you know, it becomes more of a, uh, just an ingrained part of uh, how we operate. And, you know, the, 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 the benefits, in addition to green lawns, are like, this is Bristol, England, where they, they did a, um, uh, a composting facility for their uh, their city waste, and they run the buses on the methane. It's like, you know, the, the co-benefits uh, really start to start to leap out once you kind of get over that, that initial, I don't know if, you know, this is a good idea kind of thing. Another thing that I like to think about um, because in my world anyway, and I think in lots of people's world, the notion of energy has been completely removed from the notion of work. Like uh, we have no idea when we say this house uses 15 kilowatts per meter squared, it's a passive house. I don't know what that is. Like, <laughs> could I do that? Like, could I make those 15 kilowatts per meter squared? Well, I, uh, I decided to sort of look into it and when I did this, the average Canadian home was using 30 kilowatt hours of electricity per day. Um, and so uh, at some university in the States, somebody put Lance Armstrong on a, on a stationary bike and measured his output, um, which kind of peaks in, I think, like the eight, 900 watt range. And he can like reasonably sustain about 500 watts for like 10, 15 minutes, like a good hill climb. Um, so the best... I guess, you know, drug addled at the time legs <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> Can't run a toaster. This, this human being, this very, very strong human being cannot generate enough power to make a piece of toast. And actually, I would encourage you to go on YouTube. There's actually, somebody made a great video of a, of a German cyclist like this, again, like massive legs with the toaster right in front of him. And he's like, <laughs> pedals himself to exhaustion to get the toast like lightly brown. So, yeah. So, you know, I only point that out because, you know, our our association with energy and with, you know, the, the privilege of the amount of energy we use is a lot because we're completely disassociated with what it means to, uh, to be able to make it. And I think, you know, not that that will sort of to go home and not eat toast anymore, but but I think it, it you know it's it's really important in terms of people understanding conservation to understand like what what it is you are conserving. Um, another really interesting thing is um, I think it was CANSI, the Canadian Solar Industry Association. I read somewhere anyway that having a 100 watt solar panel is the equivalent of having a fit 17 year old boy as a slave. Like that you would get as much work in a day out of a 100 watt solar panel as a, as a fit teenager. So, you know, in other words, if you wanted that teenager to pump your water for you, you know, they can pump about as much as a 100 watt solar panel would pump uh, over the course of the day. So like it's just another way of kind of like putting it in the realm of, of, uh, of you know, human effort. Um, Heinberg said we have 130 slaves working for us all the time, yeah. each of us. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you get in a car, it's crazy how much <laughs> that uh, equals. So another, another mind thing that I did for myself was when I started looking into embodied energy and carbon and stuff, you know, I'm dealing with all these figures of like gigajoules and energy and, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, well, what, like, what is that? So CMHC did a study said that there was about 2,300 gigajoules of energy embodied in the construction materials of a 2,000 square foot house in Toronto. Um, I was like, well, what is that? Like what, how much energy is that? In gasoline equivalent, it's 16,500 gallons of gas. So like, imagine that every time we build a 2,000 square foot house, essentially we're filling up one of these and then burning it, draining it. Like we're using that much energy to make one little house and then you look at a new subdivision going up and you're like oh one two three you know a couple hundred a couple thousand and and like that's the the, the level of, uh, of energy use that um, they were employing now um I'm That's sort of the end of that little section. I was just trying to do a little uh, brain shift. Um, we have some time, so maybe I'll just I'll move into the move into the next section so we have more time after lunch. Anybody thoughts or questions about that before I move on? I want to go back to that um, compost and toilet situation. What happens if I want my bath water to flush my toilet, and I run a purple pipe from my bathtub? into a tank, a larger tank over the top of my toilet, building inspector comes not allowed. What? So gray water should be stored for more than 24 hours. It needs okay. to be used. And plumbing gray water in your toilets is a horrible idea for lots of other reasons that we can talk about offline, but yeah. So now I run it to my basement, it goes through the filter. Still a bad idea. You should never use a BRAC water system in the basement for any gray water. It should go straight to landscape. Straight to landscape. Yeah. And like everybody's worried about the liability of, of gray water in the landscape. Yeah. But now imagine you've got a tank in your basement with a filter that's yeah. filtering out proteins coming off of your body. It requires chlorine injection. So now you're putting, putting in a toxic, volatile chemical. And if you forget to change the filter or re replenish the chlorine, now that the gray water system is pumping septic effluent into all of your toilets, which has more risk, a properly designed gray water system going into the landscape, which is also illegal in Alberta, yeah. um, or having the chlorinated septic effluent uh, system in your basement that's charging all your toilets up so you can use gray water. Yeah. Best is to go with composting toilets if it was legal, which it is if you have a conventional flush toilet plus a gray water system, which is currently not illegal. And there are lots of other reasons that gray water are not legal in Alberta, because I got busted for it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> namely, all the pipes are, um, and actually Jay Fish is a plumbing, or a sewage expert, he's at the back of the class, I can tell you this, but uh, all of our plumbing is at, I think it's, is it a half percent, Jay? The main trunk lines in the in the sewage system in the, in the city. Like yeah. Yeah. So if you take all the gray water out, the sewage system in the city stops functioning. Even the low flow toilets are causing these issues. And then, um, and then there's water licensing issues. So what, we have to send a certain amount of water across the border. And so the water board in Alberta is really concerned that we're not gonna meet our, our international treaty sending enough water into the states. So there's all these other issues that we can't even see at the ground level around when we start playing around with building stuff that so, so it's a hyper complex issue is, is kind of good ideas, but the implementation is sometimes more complicated than it seems. Well, thank you for that explanation. It's very good uh, because it's very frustrating knowing that that water is sitting there. I just come out of a bathtub and, you know, if I, if I keep myself reasonably clean, it doesn't come I mean, you know, I'm going to throw this down the, the toilet. Plus, every time I, I take that water out, I pay for it, that it needs to be treated and all that kind of stuff. And the trees in front of my house are suffering. And, and you know, they don't get water. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, a lot of these things are, like, like Rob said, like they're complex issues, like they're, you know, and there are solutions to them, but 
you know, the once you, and that was the reason for this last bunch of slides, like once collectively we're all kind of going down this path, it's very hard to like, especially radically yeah. kind of alter that pathway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they had that issue in Peterborough where the city gave rebates to people to put in low flush toilets and then had monstrous sewage problems because now not enough water is going through the sewer pipes to actually move the solids through properly. And it's like, like completely unforeseen, yeah. you know, circumstance. Um, likewise, the, the water manager for the city of Peterborough um, was telling us that their water conservation efforts have been so excellent that they're now having to chlorinate the system way more because more water spending more time sitting in the pipes because people are using it less that like that's turned into an issue now the water tastes really strong with chlorine and people are really upset and that was a result of everybody conserving water <laughs> which is what they were trying to get people to do so um, you know sometimes you know some things work i think at a really simple level of substitution like i can put straw bales in a wall that had mineral wool in it that's a pretty straightforward substitution. There might still be regulatory hurdles, but really the issues are pretty small. But there are other ones where, like, you, you don't even sort of see the, the repercussions of. It. But it shows how important it is to get the government involved. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, right? Yeah. And, and that's important. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting that like some of these solutions make a lot of sense to us because of when the change happens. But really, it always comes down to a yeah i do i do i spend my whole life conserving water and it's yeah yeah so you start to be that you're like oh it has the whole system has to change and we know how much yeah yeah i think about that all the time as i you know watch a new road works go up and they're pouring a concrete pier to hold up a bridge and it's like i've done a whole career of concrete free building and it's what i've saved is not even a drop in that one form of that one bridge abutment it's tiny but you know but i do think it does take you know when people do push at the boundaries you know sometimes things follow from that i don't think it makes it i don't think it makes it useless but it doesn't mean that you're necessarily you made a change doesn't mean oh everything's going to snowball now and it's you know it's all going to come around but there are jurisdictions that have done it like i said in, in uh, scandinavia it's it's code uh to to provide in new construction mm -hmm. compost and toilet. yeah so then we can ask why yeah how yeah we can find out yeah I mean, there's lots and lots of opportunities too and you know there are vast parts of the world that haven't sunk into these systems yet and yeah does uh, have a, a for yeah. For every house. Yeah. 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 And so there. Use the field. Yeah. So there, there's lots of opportunities for like how do you you know put better things in place before there's too much sun. On the health system. It's yeah. That's dangerous. Straight up. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, okay. So between now and lunch, um, what I'm going to do, and hopefully your eyes don't glaze over too much, but <laughs> is a a little bit on building science uh, because I think it's really important to have some of these notions in your head as you go into a project. Um, not that you have to be a, a building scientist or, or a super, uh, you know, building geek to, to get it. Um, hopefully what I'm going to do is try to put some of the really basic premises in a, in a really uh, easy to think about uh, way. But um, really the whole issue, the whole notion of building science is trying to ask this question, right? How can we create comfortable indoor spaces without causing human health or building durability issues? Seems like it should be a pretty easy thing to do. And seems like maybe we haven't even been doing that for a long time. Like people have been in buildings for an awfully long time and uh, you know, it hasn't killed us all yet. Um, but, but an interesting thing has happened recently uh, as we've gone from you know, cave dwellings and yurts and stone houses and thatched cottages and all that kind of stuff to this is our degree of expectation around comfort has radically shifted. I mean, your grandparents had no concept that they could 
be in a building that was always 20.5 degrees Celsius, whether it's winter or summer, and that the air in there would be relatively still and filtered, and you know that they could just flick on a light, and the light would come on, and they could go to the toilet and flush, and the water would come and go. Like what what we think of as a building now, basically, other than a shape, uh, you know, a roof and walls, bears no resemblance to what buildings have been for all of human history. And when we add that layer of complexity, um, weird things start to happen. And we've had a lot of um, a lot of unintended consequences from starting to mess with that. So, um, you know, it really wasn't until uh, the late 60s, early 70s, uh, in particular the, the oil crisis in the 70s, that people started thinking about insulating houses. And I think, you know, our expectations of comfort started to change because you know, suddenly you could put an oil furnace in a house and crank it and it didn't matter how much it was leaking and because the oil was cheap and you could afford to be comfortable uh, and wasteful. And then when that equation started to not quite balance out, um, you know, the notion of in putting insulation into the building happened. And very quickly, uh, as we realized that not only insulation, but, but sort of air movement and vapor movement uh, were part of energy efficiency, I mean, we caused a lot of problems. There are a lot of buildings with serious mold issues, uh, serious water issues, uh, things that have had to be torn down, things that have made people really sick uh, because of what happens um, when you actually do try to make radically different conditions inside uh, than outside. And so um, what I wanna do is kind of put a picture of buildings in your brain um, as having a bunch of what I like to call control layers. Um, quite often the word barrier gets used. And I think that's a bad word because I don't think humans have successfully made a barrier, <laughs> which means nothing gets through. Um, but we do a pretty good job of trying to control things uh, to a reasonable degree. Um, and so we'll talk about sort of four control layers in, in a building, um, but you can, <clears throat> start to think about them a lot like our own clothing. So, you know, you can wear a sweater and a sweater is insulation. It's got a lot of trapped air. Um, you put it on your body. It keeps you reasonably warm, but it doesn't keep you reasonably warm if you're in a windstorm. So, you know, so it's, it's playing the role of insulation. Um, but if you only had a sweater on, um, you're not, you're not going to stay warm um, in all conditions. And in fact, in most conditions, you're going to feel uh, a little bit chilly. Likewise, if it starts to rain and you're trying to keep weather out, you can put a green garbage bag over your head and that will keep uh, a whole bunch of the rain out um, for a while. It can keep most or all of it out, um, but you're not gonna be very warm under your garbage bag. Um, and if you are warm under your garbage bag, you're gonna be warm and wet under your garbage bag um, because it's keeping the rain out, but it's also keeping all your body humidity in. You can wear Gore-Tex, you can wear something that is fairly waterproof um, and allows moisture to breathe through it uh, over a sweater. And now you're starting to get somewhere where you want a building to be. You've got control layers that are shedding um, rain, shedding wind, allowing you to stay warm, but also allowing the moisture conditions to, uh, to stay reasonably balanced. And so, you know, Really in building science, you're kind of like aiming for this kind of scenario um, in your house. So just talk about those four layers um, and kind of in order of importance. Um, the first being the water control layer. This would be like anything that keeps rain out of the building. Um, so it includes the roof, it includes the walls, it includes uh, under the building and in the foundation where uh, you're not keeping rain out, but you're keeping ground moisture out. Um, and that that layer around the building um, needs to be continuous. You know, it's great if you, you know, roof half your building, half of that building will stay dry. If you don't roof the other half, it'll get wet and the whole building will sort of fail. So, um, you know, if you, if you aren't addressing that whole water control layer, um, you know, that's going to cause the, the biggest uh, most problematic issues to a building and really whether you've done the other layers properly 
ceases to matter if you're if this layer has failed. Um, and this layer is not typically anyway a layer in the building. It's not a single material. It's usually you know a whole bunch of things that transition to each other. And so while it's pretty easy to make a roof that sheds water and pretty easy to make a wall that sheds water uh, and pretty easy to make the underside of a foundation that sheds water, what gets tricky is like where those things join, making sure that that, that works. And, and you know, obviously there's, depending on the materials, there's lots of different ways to do that. But so that's, that's layer one to think about. Like, yeah, I have to be able to make sure that precipitation uh, and bulk liquid moisture somehow doesn't get into the building um, so yeah, this is what we're talking about with the water control layers, basically precipitation and groundwater. There are other sources of water, including vapor uh, and built-in moisture, but those, those we'll deal with separately. So you know, it's like, how does this rain not get into that wall? Um, that's the thinking that goes behind the water control layer. And then you've got the thermal control layer. So this is the sweater. Um, so this is the the, the material that basically slows down the transfer of heat from uh, one side of your building from the inside to the outside. And that could be trying to keep heat in in the winter. It could be trying to keep heat out in the summer, um, but you're trying to slow down that transfer. Um, and good to go into it knowing that slowing it down is all you're doing. Like it doesn't matter if you do R300. <laughs> At some point, you know, heat still moves through just in, it takes longer and less of it uh, moves through. But if you had a, an R300 house and you made it warm with a candle and then you let that candle snuff out, eventually the inside will be the same temperature as the outside. You're, you're only slowing down that movement. You're not uh, arresting it completely. Um, so, you know, materials that, that do a good job of, of slowing that down, uh, we would use as insulation. Good to remember that heat flows from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So like cold doesn't get in, heat gets out, or vice versa. Like it's 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 that something that's warmer is that heat energy is transferring to a, a place that is less warm. Um, and it does it in three ways, but the three ways are in a building fairly tied together. None of them happen just sort of independently of each other, but um, so conduction is uh, when energy moves from uh, one particle to another. So, um, you know, I touch the table. If my hand is warmer than the table, heat from my hand warms up the table. You know, when I take my hand away, if I've made the table warm and it's warmer than the air that's next to the table, the table will warm up the air. So everything's trying to move and, and balance out. So conduction is, is sort of like direct contact. Um, radiation is the movement of heat by, uh, by waves. So the sun's energy gets here through the vacuum of space um, and it arrives in, in wave form. It doesn't become heat energy until it's been absorbed by something. So um, uh, that's sort of good to remember. And so when you think about radiation, um, you can block the transfer of heat from radiation by simply blocking the source. So um, if you, um, you know, uh, put an umbrella up over your head in the, on a sunny day, you are cooler because the umbrella is absorbing that heat radiation or reflecting it depending on what it's made out of um, and not you. So, And then convection is the transfer of energy by, by fluid movement. So in buildings, we're usually talking about air um, and that's the fact that um, as fluids warm, they rise, as they cool, they drop and so um, the, you know, the warm air in this room is tending to like rise up, touch the ceiling, and then by conduction, those air molecules are warming up the ceiling tile. The air gets cooler, it falls, and quite often moves in, in loops uh, around the building. Um, so those are, those are the way the heat moves. And so obviously if we want an energy efficient house, we need to kind of consider uh, all of them in that and not just the sort of can you explain the effect of thermal mass in that situation? You put your hand on that table and you take a picture with an external camera. You can see that that table is warm in that spot. Yep. Yeah. So the sun does the same thing with yeah. the floor with the wall. So thermal mass is coming soon. Okay. We'll get there. Yeah. Um, 
So you can have the thermal control layer, you can have the sweater, but if you're not controlling the air movement, you're not going to slow down the movement of heat. In fact, it's going to move pretty quickly. So, um, you know, thinking about a sweater in a windstorm is one way to think about it. Um, but, you know, anywhere in your building where air is able to move from inside to out or outside in, depending on the, on the, uh, the temperatures and the drives, um, it's going to basically circumvent that, um, that insulation. So, you know, you can think about having your Gore-Tex sweater or your Gore-Tex layer, you know, if it's zipped right up to your chin, everything tends to stay nice. But if you open the zipper, you know, you don't stay as warm because the, the, the air movement is, uh, is, is transferring the heat away from you. And buildings, it's really hard to make a building that doesn't have a lot of air movement from inside to outside. That's the, the place where the industry is right now is everybody's recognized, oh yeah, this is really important. Having an airtight building is important. And it's kind of hard to do <laughs> because we have a million different materials all transitioning and we poke holes from inside that we want wires and pipes and doors and windows and all these different things come together. And it's really hard to, you know, really control uh, that air layer, but it's, uh, it's super important. So controlling air movement is important for, for thermal issues. Uh, you know, if you essentially have an open window, uh, you're going you're gonna to move a lot of heat uh, out of that window. But air, air control is also really important for durability and moisture concerns because what happens is when you have leaks, especially in the winter time from inside to outside, you've got conditioned air in here that's warm and relatively humid and you've got very cold, dry conditions out there. And a hole as little as an inch square, uh, this study was done in Ottawa, so fairly you know, cold winter climate, but probably no different than here. Up to 30 quarts of water will end up going through that hole and into your building system in one winter, uh, being carried on the air that's being driven out. So you probably wouldn't uh, put a little, uh, you know, opening at the top of your wall and just, you know, once a day pour a, a quart of water in because you think, oh yeah, my building's going to get wrecked if I do that. Well, your building is potentially getting wrecked, you know, when you let that happen, when you let um, small uh, air leaks drive that much moisture uh, out into the building. And again, this is something nobody quite got this right away because our buildings used to be so leaky that this was never an issue. Like if you have a million leaks in the building, like an old house, the inside conditions and the outside conditions moisture wise, like that transfer just happens fairly freely and fairly easily. It doesn't, you know, it not much happens in the way of accumulation. If you, you know, if you start to seal the building, but then start to leave little bits, it's like a balloon. Like how big a pinprick does it take to let all the air out of a balloon? One, <laughs> you know, one little hole. Um, and, and all the air will go out of that one little hole. So, you know, as you start to try to, as you acknowledge that, oh yeah, air leakage, you can't have an energy efficient building that leaks air, then you go, oh, and then you really want to control the air because this can be the unintended consequence if you if you don't. Does it have to be a vapor barrier? Does it have to be kind of? I, you'll notice I have not used the word barrier. So no, it does not need to be a vapor barrier. It needs to be an air control layer. So. An air control layer is anything that if you stuck it to your lips, you would suffocate. <laughs> so like anything that you can't breathe through. So um, it doesn't, you know, there's lots of like drywall makes a totally fine air control layer. Um, the problem with drywall is you punch a lot of holes in it to make outlets, but if those are protected, then that can be your air control layer. So this then is getting into your, your question. So mm -hmm. the, the, the last control layer to think about is the vapor control layer. And there's a lot of like, interesting um, misconceptions about this because we fairly quickly realized that this was problematic, that, that tight, well-insulated <coughs> houses could have real moisture problems because of this kind of leakage. Um, immediately the solution was to put a vapor barrier to try to prevent that air movement um, by using a plastic sheet. Um, 
So vapor, just like uh, just like uh, temperature and pressure, like moves from an area of higher concentration to low con concentration. So in the same way that if it's warm inside and cool outside, your heat energy is going to try to drive out through the building, and your insulation will slow it down, but it will still drive through. Vapor pressure does the same thing. If there's if it's higher vapor pressure in here than it is out there, nothing will stop that from balancing out eventually. Like those vapor molecules, those water molecules will go through your building materials and try to pop out the other side uh, if they can. So um, that's called diffusion. And that's, you know, the, the, at a molecular level, those water molecules driving out. Comparatively though, to, um, to air leakage, way less water moves through diffusion. So um, through that same four by eight sheet that was on the, the air leakage illustration, if there is no air leakage, about a third of a quart of water makes it diffuses through that drywall in the course of a winter. That's not so problematic. So even without a plastic barrier behind there, this is not going to destroy your building, uh, unlike the actual air leakage hole, which, which quite easily could. So our whole building industry has sort of like mistakenly sort of connected air control with vapor control. It's actually very easy to control vapor. Um, you control vapor by controlling air. If, you, if you've stopped air from moving freely, you've done the vast bulk of the work of also stopping moisture from moving freely. Uh, and the moisture that can still move freely does so usually in small enough quantities uh, that it's not problematic. And there's a whole, you know, we're looking at one side of, of a three-dimensional thing here. This is showing it going into a cup. <laughs> but in your building, if this is your interior face, it's moving through your wall or your, or your ceiling system. Um, what's on the outside makes a difference too. If it's another um, vapor control layer, then this even this quart could accumulate on that side and, and over time be problematic. If it's a material that's equally diffusive, uh, that has the same diffusion rate as the inside, that moisture will sort of pass all the way through. So when you hear the notion about breathable wall systems, I hate the term breathable wall because breathable, that's air moving. Like that's that's like, if, if that's happening, if you have a breathable wall, you've got a window open or you've got a hole, like that's breathing. Um, but vapor open or permeable, that means that you know moisture is able to diffuse um, at a certain rate, and, and vapor control layers. There's actually four categories of them uh, based on like how much diffuses uh, under certain conditions. Uh, but a, a vapor open wall system is saying, okay, let's acknowledge that this is happening, and let's make sure that that arrow kind of keeps going right out the other side, um, and that sort of keeps the building more resilient than putting something here that's going to stop that from happening so that you know eventually there is uh, an accumulation uh, of moisture as that continues to diffuse from the inside here. So then is it fair to say that the primary goal is to have the diffusion rate on the outside of the building higher than the diffusion rate on the inside? Or equal to or close-ish to, you know, if you think about you know a third of a court passing through a four by eight sheet, like if, if the material on the other side had half the diffusion rate of the inside one, that's probably not going to be problematic. But if it's a plastic sheet, it easily could be because that diffusion rate will be so slow that these third of the quarts will continue to accumulate over time. So. The effect from cold air outside at minus 20 at 70% coming through a wall, going to plus 20 inside, and then the wall, the air expanding, therefore the humidity in that air dropping. Is that an issue? Well, it wouldn't, it would be going the other way around in the winter. It would be yeah. it would be drier out there. So our in our interior vapor pressure is trying to get out there, not not the other way around. Yeah. Okay. So with the, the, the vapor control layer. What we're trying to achieve, and, and code is starting to recognize this, but at first the notion of vapor barrier was you keep try to keep everything out and then we'll be okay. Um, but we're not very good at keeping everything out. <laughs> Water uh, has a tendency to get where we don't intend it to get um, and our barriers are never perfect. So 
Uh, a better way, I think, to think about it is, is you know, trying to maintain a moisture balance. And that is like all materials have some safe storage capacity for moisture. Um, you know, the, the more porous a material, the safer, the larger its storage capacity. So, um, you know, here's where you see a really big difference between uh, natural material insulations and, and, um, and uh, inorganics like fiberglass or rock wool. When, when there's moisture around a glass of like a, a glass fiber, um, if that glass fiber <coughs> is cold and the warm, the warm air is moist around it, that glass, just like your cup, uh, your, you know, your drink cup in the summertime with ice in it, has nowhere to go except to condense on that glass. Whereas if you have uh, a piece of hemp that has like a vast amount of pore surface in it, that, that, that material actually has a, a, the ability to absorb a lot of water. Um, when we looked at straw bales, a cubic foot of straw can hold eight pounds of water in vapor form without there being any condensation. So like there's a lot of capacity there. Uh, a piece of rock sole has can handle almost zero pounds of water, um, or only the amount that the air around the fibers can hold. So this equation is based on sort of knowing what your safe storage capacity is, knowing how much moisture is making it into the space, and how quickly can that dry out. So, you know, one example of a thing that would work here would be a straw bale wall with a permeable plaster on both sides. We know that a certain amount of wetting is gonna happen, that a certain amount of moisture is gonna diffuse from the inside, say to the outside in the winter. So there's wetting, but that this is capable of storing that wetting until it pops out the other side of the wall and stays dry. So um, where this balance gets tricky is when you have inorganics and plastic or rubber membranes, you know, then you have to be very cautious. You have to be way more careful about how much is entering in the first place. Basically, you know, uh, a drywall uh, fronted glass fiber insulated um, wall with OSB on the outside that doesn't isn't very permeable. This this weight gets much smaller. Like the safe storage capacity gets way smaller. So you have to be way more careful about the wetting and be way more uh, ensure you know uh, good drying capability for that to balance. So uh, essentially, like that's uh, the safe storage capacity is what can that material handle, and that's where our sort of plant-based materials uh, do a really good job. So this is a very clear picture, but actually in the wall you can't see a thing. Nope. So is it a good idea to have? Uh, moisture sensors now in your straw bale wall and, and see this on a light. I, I, I think it's more important to have moisture sensors in your not straw bale wall. I put moisture sensors in straw bale walls for a decade and never saw anything to be exactly. concerned about. But I would be more concerned about having them in a, in a conventional built wall where if, you know, somebody didn't detail that plug opening right and that's a big leak into the wall system and you know, that moisture is accumulating in there, that's way more potentially problematic than yeah. you know, straw bale wall. Are you using a vapor barrier in your straw bale wall? No. Well, we're using a vapor control layer, which is our plaster, which prevents air from moving in. And so we're controlling the vapor because only X amount will diffuse through that plaster. So, yeah. probably not a Mm -hmm. No, you certainly wouldn't want that. No, no. But the problem with those materials is that, like, from a resiliency point of view, there, there is no way, there is no safe storage capacity in that system, or very little. So, you know, so you as the builder do a great job. The house is super airtight. Everything's great and your homeowner drills a, a new sconce in the wall and suddenly now that's leaking and that system has no capacity to sort of take that that extra moisture load so it works on paper and it works maybe for a while but it doesn't have a lot of uh, sort of like capacity built into it for uh, potential changes or issues in the future mm -hmm.
at the renovations in fiberglass, it's the only black spots anywhere where there's problems. Yeah, there's where there was air leakage. Yeah. You only find it when you're doing renovation. Yeah. So, whoa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What a mess. Yeah. So, how do you just Yeah, so there needs to there needs to be enough to activate them. Um, so you need like a relatively high um, moisture content in the in the air for for them to be activated. When you tend to get the most movement through the building is in the winter, and what we found with all the monitoring we did is that. You know, obviously the outside conditions are way more dominant than your inside conditions. Like your building's only this big and the atmosphere is gigantic. We get our lowest moisture readings in walls that we study at peak heating season. Basically the drive is so hard going out that you know, the, the material, like it's, it's, it's leaving the far side of the plaster faster than it's accumulating from the inside. Um, you get the opposite happening in the summer um, so you, but the, the difference usually isn't as high, right? Like we can be going from 70% RH inside in the winter to zero outside. Whereas in the summer, it might be 80 or 90 inside, but it's like 60 or 70 inside. So the drive is way less. So there's more, less of that happening, but the, the higher levels in the wall will happen at that point. But I mean, again, like after, you know, 20 years of making buildings like that and, and 10 years of sticking monitors and like, Never have we ever found any issues of mold from from that kind of moisture transition. Like if there's a direct leak in the wall, that's a that's another that's another question. But then that has the same implications in almost any system. I'm sure the maintenance certain kinds of soil more naturally static, static and uh, it's so by using straw or barley. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure. It would it'd more have to do, I think, not so much with the kind of straw, but, but, but where it was grown. Uh, if, you know, if there's the, the higher the spore count, you know, in the field where it's grown, the higher it's going to be on the, on the plant itself. But there is a, a, a big buffer, like a big safe zone, <clears throat> like uh, at 7%. To twenty six percent is a, is the safe zone for for not rotting. Yeah. So that 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 dry straw bale at seven or ten percent installed can go all the way up to twenty six percent before it starts rotting. Yeah. So there is a, a big yeah, and that's why we that's why we stopped monitoring because yeah. we realized that after a decade we hadn't seen anything even climb over twenty. So yeah, the difference between seven really and twelve percent, fifteen percent is not an issue. Yeah. Right. As yeah. long as you stay under that one and six percent, yeah, okay. and it can even spike over that oh, yeah. for you know, for, like it's not gonna months. like rot instantly, yeah. it's you know, it actually yeah, three so months after reaching 26, yeah, still nothing up, yeah. And then hemp has you know, the 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 the, the coating on it and the, and the silica content and all that, those you know, and that is with straw as well, with, with you know, they, they are safe up to a point, yeah. Yeah, you only have to think like if if I go to a hundred year old barn in Ontario where straw and hay has been stored, it's still all there. You know, it's gone through the full cycle of the highest possible RH and the lowest, and it's cycled through that for years, and it it's still there. So um, it's pretty resilient that way. Um, so this last this last drawing is just to sort of show you know as you design a building, you want to be thinking about uh, this is from a, a friend's slide, so he uses the word I hate barriers, but um, we'll say control layers. But you know, essentially, you know, being able to trace those mm -hmm. control layers continuously all the way around the building, um, which is kind of easy to do by just drawing around the building. But what you really have to think about is like where things transition. Like you know, that's a fine red line as say a, 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 an air control layer, but when it gets to a window, what's it doing? Like if it ends and then there's an air gap and then there's a window, then it's not an air barrier. It's like, how does that transition all the way to the window? How does it connect to the window, top, bottom, and sides? So, you know, being able to um, conceive of 
those control layers at the drawing stage and, and super importantly, and usually the place where these things fail is, is translating that on site, you know, that, that it's important that, that those, those barriers remain continuous um, at all the different connection points. Um, so, you know, you could make a really great energy efficient building that is uh, really durable, will hold up really well out of all kinds of different materials if that's done really well. Um, and if it's not, then the more resilient materials, your plant-based materials are more likely to be able to handle problems uh, than, than the organics. So you mentioned windows. There are no plant-based windows. You're right. So what are we going to do with those windows? Those big holes that are now all of a sudden right next to R50 wall. And now you have only an R, what is the best insulated window? R15, R11? Yeah, in that range, if you want to pay well, a bunch of money. Now yeah. we've got these big holes. Yeah. So, well, it's not a hole. It's a, it's a uh, reduction. Your insulation. It's a reduction in your yeah. thermal control layer. Yeah. Um, and that, I mean, here's the thing. If you want the most energy efficient house, don't have windows. And only have one door, and and that's it. Like totally reasonable. If you want to do that, that's fine. Open if you want, yeah, shutter, removable sure. insulation. Yeah, goes 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 yeah. at night or yeah. when you're not using. And again, to me, that goes back to those goals. If somebody yeah. wants the most energy efficient house possible, and my thing of like maintenance and and involvement, if you're willing to close shutters at night and open shutters in the morning. You will your energy efficiency will go through the roof. It will be yeah. awesome. It'll be yeah. amazing. But you got to do that. And oh, so you not put it on a motor and center. Yeah. You got an iPad. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel like you're saying. Correct me if I'm wrong. There seems to be seems to be have been a little bit of a, a hypothesis that some of our natural materials are the worst poisonous because of potential their potential. Academic degree. And what, I, what I feel like I'm hearing in your argument is it's actually the opposite. Yeah. And that natural material is a far better job at um, giving you almost a safety factor with, yep. with the vapor barriers. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. And so, has that understanding, that building science understanding, kind of hit the level of uh, the. It's, it's definitely hitting the building science world at the level of like researchers and building geeks like um, uh, buildingscience.com which puts a lot of stuff online and uh, and the principles have been sort of at the forefront of all this um, the head guy Joel Stiebrick just recently published he published this thing about eight or ten years ago called the perfect wall this was his like perfect you know everything all these control layers were handled really well and he just revised the perfect wall to be a, a vapor permeable system with some storage capacity so Yes, at that level it is, but at the level of I'm talking to a building official who's working with the language that's in the code, it's not there right now. But it is with bone sites. What's that? It is with bone sites. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It is with bent back bone sites. What is bone sites? Recycled newspapers. Yeah. Yeah. Cellulose. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so just before we break for lunch, I just got to really quickly touch on thermal mass, which again we could spend a lot of time on. Um, but the thing that I want to make really clear, a lot of people think of thermal mass as as a part of energy efficiency. That if a building has more mass, it's more efficient, which is not true at all. Like it's just storage capacity, and and the sort of mind thing that I use is. You know, if I live in a tent, the second the sun comes out, my tent is hot. And the second the sun goes down, my tent is cold. If I have a giant boulder in my tent, <laughs> you know, it's going to not get as hot in the tent as quickly because a whole bunch of that heat energy that would be making the air around me and me really warm is actually going to warm up the boulder. And at night, the boulder is going to warm up me in the air for a while uh, before the tent has cooled down. The number of BTUs coming off the sun has not changed. You know, the number of BTUs leaving the tent hasn't changed. The, the rate of change has gone down. So if you have a building with a lot of thermal mass, 
if you want it to get warm in that building, it's going to take longer for it to get warm. And if you want it to cool down, it's going to take longer to cool down. Sometimes that's great. Sometimes that's really what you want. Sometimes that's absolutely the wrong thing and it's not what you want. And again, it goes back to like specifically for this building. If I'm working on a cottage with somebody, if we design a high thermal mass cottage with a masonry heater, they're going to get to the cottage Friday night. They're going to light a fire. They're going to burn that fire all night. And by like Saturday afternoon, the cottage is going to be warm. And then they're going to pack up on Sunday and leave. And the cottage is going to be warm till Tuesday. That's not an effective use of thermal mass, you know, um, commercial buildings where, you know, doors open and close a lot. Those really benefit from thermal mass. But if you want a building that responds quickly to temperature inputs, you don't want a lot of thermal mass. So it's not, it's not a right wrong and it's not a more or less efficient. It's just, you know, what, what are your needs and expectations for the building? So, um, you know, there's a lot of worry about not having enough thermal mass. When you build a building, like, try picking up all the materials that went into it. <laughs> it's heavy. Like there's a lot of thermal mass in any building. Like the, the, the stack of drywall that went into this building is a lot of thermal mass. It's the equivalent of that boulder. So is the flooring and the framing and all of that kind of stuff. So we, we have tend to have a lot of mass in buildings anyway. You can add a whole bunch of extra mass, but to go to your question of the sun comes in through the day, through my windows and warms up my concrete floor, and then that heat beautifully radiates out of that floor at night. I know in my climate in Ontario, that shit doesn't work. Like <laughs> we don't see enough direct sunlight in the winter for that to, to do a great job. The sun is really low on the horizon. So if I don't have windows that go right to the ground, I've got a shadow line that's cast to about here. If I have any furniture or rugs, that sunlight and the sun's moving very quickly, like in the course of the seven hours that it's out, it's aimed over there and now it's aimed over here, that the amount of captured energy is small. And so you're not going to feel this like, oh, it's night. My floor is radiating this beautiful warmth. Um, in places where there's more winter sunlight, possibly here, that, that could be more of an effect. Um, but again, if you, if you have a lot of thermal mass, what will happen is all that sunlight, same amount of sunlight, house A and house B, house with a lot of thermal mass, the temperature of that slab might rise by a degree. You know, the house with no thermal mass, if you have absolutely no thermal mass, the air temperature in the house might rise by 10 degrees. You know, like it would just heat up all that air because there's nowhere for the heat to go if it's well insulated. So like, but the, 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 floor at one degree warmer is not going to feel really warm at night. Like it's going to help temper the, the temperature swing that the lighter mass building is going to get hotter and then get colder, get hotter and then get colder. That the, the one whole lot of thermal mass is going to do that. So it can be more comfortable to have thermal mass, but if your thermal mass isn't at the temperature you want it to be at, then it's going to take a lot of, of time of heat input to, or heat reduction to make that change. So High thermal mass buildings tend to not be great in the shoulder season where you might have a plus 15 day and a zero night. Like if you if you want the heat to go away in the day, it's like, oh, it's hot in here. If you've got a lot of thermal mass, you know, it's still going to be warm and then it'll just be cooling off at the point where it's suddenly you want it warm now at night. So, you know, it's something you want to consider, but it's not like it's not an essential to a high performance building. It's more a, a matter of, of uh, how stable you want the temperature to be and how hard you want it to be to change that temperature. Uh, so, so you're saying passive solar design is not a big issue? Oh, I'm saying it's a huge issue. Here we go. Next is passive solar design. <laughs> it's a huge issue because, you know, that the amount of energy coming from the sun is, is large and you want to take advantage of that when it's cold out. What I'm saying is how you work with that in the building doesn't always need a lot of thermal mass. And in, in some cases, thermal mass like reduces the effect that you feel from that. So the same number of BTUs are going to come in through the window, but if you've got a huge amount of thermal mass and a small amount of sunlight, it's not going to feel like, oh, I got warm when the sun came out. So that's, yeah. But I would say, yeah, this is, you know, I think 
passive solar should be like 1.1.1a of our building code. Like, how is it that the source of all energy on the planet is not relevant to how we design buildings? It's like, <laughs> you should think about this. Um, and you have to think about it in, in 3D. You have to think about it in terms of, you know, where the sun is, you know, sort of on the east to west axis and how it, it changes winter to summer, how, um, you know, it, it, it comes up uh, further, uh, crosses over the sort of east west axis in the summer and doesn't nearly come close to that in the winter and then and then angle uh, in the sky too as, uh, as the seasons change. So, you know, you want to, you want to think about that a lot with your building. Um, I think too often passive solar only gets thought of in terms of uh, passive heat, solar heat gain in the winter, when actually solar exclusion in the summer is probably a bigger um, impact on the energy efficiency of the building than heat gain in the winter. So, you know, the, the early 70s, 80s experiments of passive solar where people did like three-story window glazed south. Look at all the sunlight I'm going to get. Like, it was awesome for five minutes before it overheated uh, in the winter. And it was terrible in the summer. Like, there were ovens in the summer. And so, you know, you have to think about both sides. And so, you know, a lot of people will be, you know, tell me, oh, they not even going to think about passive solar because, you know, there's trees in front of their house or they're you know, next to a taller building or on the wrong side of a hill. It's like, no. You still think about passive solar, just your gains might be limited, but you still want to be thinking about uh, about that. Um, and likewise, I think, you know, if you read passive solar books, everybody's talking about this. <clears throat> what you really need for passive solar is, is like long skinny rectangle facing south because you want to maximize your exposure to the sun in the south. Well, it does do that. It gives you a lot of exposure to the south. It equally gives you a whole bunch of exposure to the north. So, you know, um, unless you're building really energy efficient, you know, sometimes all the, the added gains, uh, you know, uh, also are, are counteracted by added losses. But really, any house shape can work like squares, L's, B's, circles. Like, it's more thinking about where the sun is going to be, thinking about what other factors might uh, affect orientation on the site, about the site itself. Um, but you can take any building on any site and apply passive solar thinking to it, um, which includes not just, yeah, like I said, heat gains from the south, but uh, exclusion. So overhangs on the south in the summertime and thinking in particular in our climates about Western exposures where, you know, it's really easy to make a nice overhang on the south uh, that, that keeps the, the summer sun out, but lets the winter sun in. But uh, the west side of the building, the sun's already low in the sky. Like you need a monstrous overhang to make a difference um, on that side. And so, like western overheating uh, can be a, can be a way bigger problem um, than than uh, not having enough solar gain on the south. Say, so you know, thinking about you know strategies around like porches, vines, tree planting, like all that kind of stuff. This is you probably want to be thinking. Um, as much, if not more, about the west side than about the, uh, about the south. So, I mean, this isn't going to be a whole take on how to do passive solar design, but it's just like you know, um, consider all the all the uh, the options and really think about um, solar exclusion. I was just at the Passive House Conference in Vancouver, and you know, they're already showing that when they make a building really energy efficient, summertime overheating is now that's the Passive House problem. It's like we figured out keeping heat in <laughs> in the winter, but in, in the summer it's it's harder to do. And so if you have a really well insulated house, it's got a couple big west windows, and it's summertime, like your your air conditioning bill is going to go through the roof, and it's going to be probably a bigger energy effect than not getting enough uh, uh, heat in in the summer. Yeah. So the conventionalism I've heard historically is a lot of sort of the east, the east and south. In Possibly. Yeah. Here, is we tend to have like cloudy morning or afternoons can be really sunny. Mm -hmm. So in the winter, you want to gather that afternoon sun preferentially, but in the summer, yeah, it's that's right, yeah, yeah. So you, you put your garage in or your car quotes, or sure, yeah, whatever on the west, so yeah. Right. Or I mean, those are the kind of scenarios where um, you know uh, vines and bushes and deciduous trees do a good job. Like they're shading you. 
in the summer, the leaves go down and they're letting a bunch of that heat in the winter. So yeah, like strategies, it's figuring out like what is the strategy for this location, for this building, and it'll be different by, by climate, by site, by building type, but yeah. exterior insulated shutter. That can help. Yeah. Yeah. Although not everybody wants their house to be dark at four o'clock in the afternoon. So, you know, that will work for some people. But you know, people. Yeah. Um, so I think I have one more slide and then it's lunchtime. So, um, so this is just a quick look. So this is my house in Peterborough. This is taken December 21st, this is taken June 21st. It's not rocket science to get that shadow line right to the bottom of those windows and that one there and vice versa to get the shadow lines at the top of the windows. So maximum summer gain, uh, maximum winter shading. You'll notice that there's not a lot of openings on the west side of that building because of the nature of the lot. The west side is our long side. Um, so a lot of exposure. Um, so really minimal windows on that side. And because you know the, our lot is narrow uh, on the south side, most people would consider, oh, you can't like you can't really do passive solar there. It's the wrong orientation. Well, we get about thirty percent of our winter heat input from passive solar. So it's not like a narrow south-facing building can't be passive solar. It's just you know how do you arrange it uh, to maximize that? And it might not get as much gain as a as a longer skinnier house going the other direction, but it's not something to be either it is yeah the you can tell one. right by the beautiful plaster exterior <laughs> yeah no we we've actually don't do a lot of exterior plaster finishes anymore um, people have a hard time maintaining them um, in this neighborhood we weren't allowed to because uh, peter has a rule this is an existing neighborhood if the material doesn't exist on your block, you can't introduce it. So there was that. But beyond that, um, especially two-story buildings, um, life just gets so much easier if we just green screen over that that plaster. That I really honestly have no idea that, like in my head, a straw bale house was like plaster all the way. I, mean, that, I just have no idea. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Was, we did one last year. Like the entire building is metal on the outside. Hmm. Not, at all. So yeah, it doesn't mean, it doesn't tell you mean. Yes, that's actually my last slide. So we can pause and, and do lunch. Yeah. So it's 12.43, two, that gives like an hour and a quarter because people have to leave. Yeah. Yeah, we'll start right at two. Right at two, because I look for two. Okay, thanks everybody. So this one is uh, made out of straw bale panels. Right? Yes. Three panels made of straw bale panels. Uh, part of it. The, the back side was all sight and yeah. yeah. yeah.